an investment you cannot lose. Christian stewardship. Money is an important subject to God. 16 of Jesus' 38 parables pertain to the handling of money and possessions. In the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, an amazing one out of every 10 verses, 288 in all, deal directly with the subject of money and our possessions. There are more verses in the Bible addressing money and possessions than there are on faith or prayer. That's because a God of love wants us not only to live with him throughout eternity, but to live happy, holy and abundant lives here on earth as well. Money worries and fear for future finances are consistently among the greatest concerns people report having. People worry about having enough money to pay their bills. They are concerned that they may not have enough saved for a dignified retirement. What will happen to them if they have an unexpected health emergency? God never intended that you and I would have to worry about such things. In fact, even in this troubled world, he wants us to trust in him and know that he holds the future in his hands. Therefore, do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Matthew chapter 6 verse 31 and 32. Today, we're going to examine God's plan for our eternal security and well-being. It all started back in the Garden of Eden. Planet Earth had just come from the Creator's hands. In all its splendour and perfection, glorious beyond description, the stroke of the master artist greeted the eye at every turn. Magnificent sunrises were rivalled only by breathtaking sunsets. Peaceful lakes nestled between the hills. Blossoming vines and gorgeous flowers of every hue delighted the senses. Songbirds filled the air with their melodious songs. Animals in the lush meadows played and roamed unafraid. How Adam and Eve must have enjoyed the perfect world God had created for them. But there was more. The Lord God planted a garden and there he put met the man whom he had formed. Genesis chapter 2 verse 8. Just think, somewhere amid the wonder and beauty of the newborn world, God designed a garden home for Adam and Eve. Not only did God provide a beautiful place for them to live, he also explained the delightful food he had provided for them. I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Genesis chapter 1 verse 29. Adam and Eve had no bills to pay, no taxes to worry about, no locks or keys, no vandals or burglars, no hospitals or pharmacies. They enjoyed perfect health and endless youth, undying commitment to each other and a boundless love for God. God wanted them to share these blessings, so he said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. God also knew that mankind should have work to do, tasks that would provide a sense of accomplishment and satisfaction. He gave Adam and Eve responsibility for oversight of this beautiful new world. He told them, Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, 
and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. While everything belongs to God, he entrusted mankind with the stewardship of the earth. According to Webster's New World Dictionary, a steward is one who acts as a supervisor of finances and property for another. God is the owner. We are the stewards, managing God's property. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein, Psalms 24 verse 1. Again God says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. Psalms 50, verse 10 and 11. Even our ability to work and earn money is a gift from God to us. We really don't own anything. As our creator, God has a claim on our possessions and lives. And if you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. When Adam and Eve were placed in the garden, God gave them specific instructions to follow. Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. This was a test of man's loyalty. It was also a reminder that God was the ultimate owner of everything. By obeying God's commands, they would demonstrate their love for him and acknowledge him as the owner of everything. By being faithful stewards, they would be able to live forever in a world that was a paradise. But Adam and Eve failed the one simple test God required of them. They failed to live in recognition of God's ownership of everything and instead disobeyed the one who had given them freedom to eat from every tree but one. They lost their innocence, their happiness and their garden home. They fell from royalty to slavery. Satan celebrated. But centuries later, Satan's dominion would be shattered by Christ's birth into this world. The devil's plan was to deceive the divine Son of God as easily as as he had deceived Adam and Eve. After Jesus had fasted for 40 days, Satan took him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Satan hoped to entice Jesus with the kingdoms of this world but he did not succeed. The things that Satan had promised to give Jesus were not his to give, and Jesus would not sell out his relationship with his father for the things of this world. Though Satan tried to tempt and entice Jesus for the next three and a half years, Jesus faithfully obeyed his father's will. When Jesus died on Calvary's cross, Satan was not only defeated, his fate was sealed forever. Jesus was the conqueror and the devil was defeated. Everything we are and everything we have was made possible by that gift of Jesus on the cross. Whether we know it or not and whether we love him or not, our very lives and everything we own are because of him. Not only is he our creator, 
but he is our redeemer as well. And like Adam and Eve, we are stewards of what God entrusts to us. So what does God require of us? Thankfully, the Bible is clear about our responsibility. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. I want to be a faithful steward, don't you? But what is it that we are to be stewards of? The greatest gift God has entrusted to us is life itself. The Apostle Paul declares, God, who made the world and everything in it, gives to all life, breath and all things. Acts 17 verse 24 and 25. Our life originates with God and he sustains it. Every heartbeat, every breath of air, every pulse of our bodies is a gift from God. Paul wrote, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, Romans 12.1. A living sacrifice means unreserved commitment, a surrender to Christ and his leadership in our lives. We should seek to use our lives to bless others and to protect our health and strength as stewards of the gift of life. We are also stewards of our time. Someone once said, time is the stuff life is made of. The psalmist seemed to recognise this responsibility when he wrote, So teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Psalms 90 verse 12. To waste time is to waste life itself. We all have the same number of hours in a day and minutes in each hour and we will give account for the choices we've made to fill them. One of the ways we acknowledge God's ownership of our time is by remembering the specific time he's requested us to recognise as his. The Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, has been made holy by our Maker and we are asked to dedicate those hours for worship and refreshment. He invites us to put aside the cares of the week, the pressures of work, shopping and worldly pursuits, and remember him as our creator. We are also stewards of the talents that God gives us. Well, you may ask, what are the specific talents for which we are responsible as God's stewards? I don't think I have any talents. The fact is, we all have talents. When we think of talents, we usually think of the ability to sing well, play an instrument or sport, paint a picture, speak or write well, or organise and lead. But some talents are not so obvious the ability to make others feel comfortable and accepted, the talent of entertaining and hospitality, the gift of a listening ear and understanding heart. These talents may be less obvious, but are just as important. Every ability we have to bless others, we have received from God. Paul wrote, And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7. Not only are we stewards of the time and talents God has given us, we're also stewards of the money we have received. In the Bible, it is clear that those 
whose lives were dedicated to God, were also generous with the finances they had received from him. One day, Abraham's nephew, Lot, and his family were taken captive from their home in Sodom by an enemy tribe. When the news reached Abraham, he determined to rescue Lot and the others. He prayed for God to be with him and give him success. God was with him. Lot and his family were rescued and the treasures taken by the enemy were recovered. As Abraham approached Sodom, the king came out to meet him, urging him to keep the treasures he had recovered and only return the captives to their homes. But Abraham refused to take anything for himself. Melchizedek, a priest of God, brought Abraham a meal and blessed him. Then Abraham gave him a tithe of all. Genesis chapter 14 verse 20. Abraham wanted to express his appreciation for God's guidance in securing the rescue of Lot. His returning the tithe acknowledged God's ownership and blessings. 150 years later, Abraham's grandson expressed his gratitude to God in the same way. While fleeing from his angry brother, Jacob felt utterly alone and afraid. He desperately wanted the protection of God, but he felt so guilty for robbing the birthright from his brother Esau that he feared God had forsaken him and would not forgive him. With a great sense of remorse, Jacob confessed his wrongs to God and then wearily lay down on the ground and slept. Then he dreamed, and behold... A ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Genesis chapter 28, verse 12. When Jacob awoke, he knew that God had spoken, promising guidance and protection. Deeply touched, he gratefully promised, Of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Genesis chapter 28, verse 22. Have you ever wondered how to thank God for his incredible goodness to you? For the gifts of life, family, health and material blessings? Do you sometimes wonder if thank you is enough? King David felt the same way when he asked, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? Psalms 116 verse 12. The Bible principle of stewardship provides a tangible way of expressing our appreciation to God for all his benefits. The first written instruction regarding tithing or returning a tenth to the Lord is recorded in the book of Leviticus. And all the tithe of the land whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. Leviticus chapter 27 verse 30. As we return the Lord's tithe, we are continually impressed with the truth that God is the creator and the source of every blessing. And how is the tithe to be used? Well, the book of Numbers explains... Behold, I have given the children of Levi, ministers in the service of God, all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Numbers chapter 18 verse 21. Throughout the Bible, we find that the tithe was always dedicated to the support of the ministry. In the New Testament, Paul says, Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple? And those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 
verse 13 and 14. Christ commended the tithing system of his day, even as he rebuked the scribes and Pharisees for their narrow-minded approach to religion. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought have to have done without leaving the others undone. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Perhaps you are wondering how you could possibly give a tenth of your income to the Lord. Many people have wondered the same thing. But all who have made the decision to trust God's guidance and wisdom have seen his blessings in their lives. Somehow, nine-tenths of their income stretched farther than ten-tenths ever did. There was Maria, who squeezed an honest tithe out of a slim paycheck. It seemed hard at first, but later she was blessed with her own business that flourished and brought financial security. Now she gives God the credit for her financial success and delights in giving to advance the Lord's work. Or take Ed, for example, who took a leap of faith by closing his business on Sabbath, the busiest day of the week, only to be rewarded by increased business on the other six days of the week. These people discovered the secret to financial security. God is a promise keeper. And what these Christians discovered firsthand was that what was promised by God through the prophet Malachi, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. Not only are there blessings promised for those who return a faithful tithe, there is also a warning given for those to choose not to do so. God calls this robbery. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings, Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. While tithe is defined as the 10% that belongs to God, offerings are given of our own free choice from that which is left over. Many have discovered that there are blessings from giving offerings freely as well. Jesus said, Give and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Luke chapter 6 verse 38. What a beautiful plan God has given for financing his work on earth. He asks us to give from our hearts, never fearing for our own needs, because he can meet them and more. It's not that God needs our money, but he does need us to remember that he is the creator and owner of everything, including our very lives, and he's also the one who provides for all our needs. And the mission of the church to take the news of Jesus to the whole world should not need to be financed by lotteries, bingo games or raffles. God's plan is so much better than that. And tithing is a fair and reasonable way to share the burden of supporting God's work. Each person's tithe is proportionate to what they have received. If you earn a thousand dollars, then you return one hundred to God. If you earn a hundred, you return ten dollars. What a fair system! As we give, we grow in love and compassion and a faithful and loving God always gives us more 
than we can give him. One of Jesus' fascinating parables was about a diligent, industrious farmer who worked hard and had a tremendous crop at harvest time. The harvest was so great that his barns couldn't contain it. They were already bursting and the crop wasn't in yet. What could he do? He struggled over the decision. Should he give the excess to the poor? But he thought, it's mine. Had not he been the one who planned carefully? Hadn't he been the one who had worked so hard? He convinced himself of what to do. I will do this. I will put, pull down my barns and build greater and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. Luke chapter 12 verse 18 to 21. This rich farmer did not acknowledge where his blessings came from. He did not recognise his creator or his obligations as a steward. He utterly forgot the poor, the orphans, the widows and homeless. He thought only of himself. He had a problem that the Bible's teaching on stewardship is meant to protect us from. Jesus said, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 21 Jesus was very serious about our attitude toward our possessions. If not surrendered to Jesus, they could lead us away from God, even resulting in the loss of our eternal life. He said, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world? and loses his own soul, Matthew 16, 26. What a blessing the Bible's teaching on stewardship is. In a world in which our lives have become so complex and busy, the Bible urges us to remember from where all our blessings come. It encourages us to consider the price that was paid to redeem our lives from sin and death. It reminds us, that everything we have is a gift from God. Our lives are a gift from God. Our health is a gift from God. Every breath we take is a gift from a God who loves us unconditionally. The food we eat, the clothes we wear, the house we live in, all are gifts from God. When we give back to God, we are saying, Thank you, Lord, for what you have given me. Would you join with me now as we pause and pray, thanking God for what he's done for us? Dear Father in heaven, today we want to recognise you as our creator and redeemer. We want to recognise that every good and perfect gift comes from you. With grateful hearts, we thank you for providing for all of our needs, for blessing us more than we can ever recognise or repay. We want to make a commitment today to be faithful stewards by your grace of that which you have entrusted to us. We want to be faithful not only in our tithes and love offerings, but also in our time, talents 
energy and health. We know that as we do so, you can do more for and through us. You can give us greater blessings and abilities and accomplishments for your name's honour and glory. We want to be all that we can be for you and for the world in need around us. Please see our hearts, see our needs and keep us faithful to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.